All right. Well, uh, more people uh, are joining us. Uh, hello, everyone, again. Uh, thank you for being here. My name is uh, Angelique Lentjes. Welcome to our webinar, uh, Zero Energy Buildings, a Hard Necessity for Climate Action. This uh, webinar is hosted to you by the TU Delft Extension School for Continuing Education. Please raise your questions in the Q&A. We will try to answer as many questions as we can during uh, uh, the webinar or at the end uh, during the Q&A. Our speaker of today is uh, Andy van der Dobbelsteen, Professor of Climate Design and Sustainability, and as well, Sustainability Coordinator at TU Delft. Andy, welcome to you as well. Um, please Thank go you. ahead, the floor is all yours. Okay, thanks Angelique for uh, introducing us and, uh, and me. Um, I will start sharing my screen with the presentation, see how if it works. Um, yes, okay. Um, well, uh, thanks for being here. Um, we decided to organize this webinar uh, because we have had um, a MOOC and Prof Ed, uh, a massive open online course and a professional education course online already for quite some years, so five or seven years, five or six years. And um, um, the topic zero energy design is actually uh, something that uh, has only become more urgent. And uh, we thought it would be nice to have a short uh, lecture about that. Also to, uh, um, to uh, introduce the two courses in the end. So my first half of my presentation will be sort of a lecture about zero energy design and uh, the, past, the last one will be about uh, uh, the courses. Um, uh, I'll, I'll do this together with Willem van der Spoel, Leo Gommans, Sibe Broersma and Arjan Babay, who are my support, right hand support, uh, all of them. Um, uh, but let's start. Um, I think it's very important to uh, understand that we have a great sustainability challenge uh, in the world. Uh, one has to do with be becoming climate adaptive since the climate is changing rapidly. Um, we also have to become carbon neutral very soon to avoid runaway climate change in the long run. Um, and circularity is then also a means to reduce carbon emissions, but also to get control over resources. Uh, the last thing is that we can still improve our living environment by uh, contributing to health, happiness, and biodiversity in, in our environment. Um, this, courses, uh, this, this lecture is, of course, more about energy, so about becoming carbon neutral related to the energy use in the built environment. Um, first, I want to uh, show a little uh, teaser film. I hope that it will start. Without noticing, an invisible world is hiding in the house and in the equipment we use. Everything we use at home costs energy. The peaks in usage can sometimes go up to 20 kilowatts. That is almost impossible. The douche is there. Oh, yeah, that's love. Yeah, so that's a very short uh, uh, film, um, which in full is about a small, a little eight minutes that you can watch on YouTube. It's part of uh, the, the Prof. Ed and MOOC that we organized. Um, and it's nice to know that it won a Gouden Reiger. <laughs> it's a Golden Heron, which is a Dutch Oscar for commissioned film. So we're very proud of that. Uh, I think it's a very nice film to get a better understanding of the energy used in uh, households. Um, and as I said, it was developed for the Zero Energy Design uh, online course. Uh, which was also uh, a winner of uh, being the best online course worldwide with the edX uh, community. So uh, we're also really proud about that. And, um, um, and we're trying to do our best to, to improve it all the time. Um, what we learn, what we teach uh, during that course is that uh, you have several steps that can bring you to a zero energy built environment or building, looking at researching the local circumstances, reducing the demand, reusing residual flows and producing renewable energy in the end. Um, these are the main steps that we also teach in uh, the courses. And I will run through them uh, quickly. Um, starting with research, um, it's good to know that, of course, we, we have a world with different climates um, and, and the students uh, that are joining our courses come from all over the world. So they all have to deal with different climates. And this maybe is a map that shows the old climate. It's the Köppen-Geiger map that demonstrates 
basically uh, uh, the climates as they were maybe 30 years ago. Um, we know at the moment that we have a problem um, and that uh, especially is visible in the global surface temperature of the oceans more than that we can measure it in the air because air can easily heat up or cool down. But if an ocean is heating up, then getting rid of that heat and the temperature of the ocean then becomes really difficult. And what we see since uh, February, March uh, 2023 is that we've uh, measured uh, in, uh, incredible temperatures in the ocean that have never gone down below earlier levels again. And in 2024, well, this is only showing the measurements until March, but the, uh, the, the temperatures have ever become ever more extreme. So there is really something happening in the climate and we might have already gone beyond a tilting point. Um, so it's not for nothing that the IBCC says that we have we need uh, radical action and uh, that we uh, um, yeah um, most likely are not going to stay within 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, and that we really have to work hard to stay within two degrees. And if we don't manage to do that, then... Um, Basically, all the models are very unclear of what is going to happen to the world, but it will be devastating in many places. And it's already happening. So we see extremes already here and there uh, related to flooding, uh, hailstones that are uh, giant sized, uh, wildfires, but also storms. Um, and you could say basically that these extremes now might be quite common around 2050. So we have to be uh, aware of that and, and take it into account. Um, in our own country, the Netherlands, we experienced extreme temperatures in uh, summer as well. We never had temperatures beyond 38 degrees uh, until last uh, a few summers. And uh, so there was a 40 degrees measurement. And um, it's even worse in urban areas because we know that um, urbanized areas are actually even hotter than what you uh, get to see at the, the news and at the weather reports, because uh, that's always measured outside cities. Uh, why is that? It's because of the urban heat island effect, um, which is mostly related to the absorption of solar radiation and, and the emission of heat therefrom, uh, but also anthropogenic heat. So heat that uh, comes from human activities, vehicles, buildings, air conditioners, uh, and of course, uh, the cities that haven't been designed to actually passively cool. Um, so these are all things we have to take into account in many places of the world. Now, we are a temperate climate, but you can just imagine how much worse it is in climates that are more tropical or subtropical. Um, in Europe, we see that, for instance, in the south, uh, where in Sicily, for instance, there has been a few summers already around 50 degrees, uh, meaning that some of these cities become uninhabitable. And if we want to make them uh, sort of livable in the future, we have to take away the heat. Um, and, and use that perhaps for, for winter heating, um, thereby cooling the city. And, and that's, of course, where climate adaptation, the cooling of cities, goes well together with uh, saving energy and therefore climate mitigation, as it is called. Um, well, if we take a first step once we've understood the local circumstances and conditions, um, then it's good to see that, um, well, if you analyze buildings, uh, we still lose a lot of energy uh, especially in wintertime, but also in summertime when it relates to cold that is being lost into the wa warm environment. Um, so it always starts with reducing the demand. Um, on the left-hand side, you see basically urban and, and architectural measures that you can take. On the right-hand side, it's about equipment that you usually need in buildings that can be either energy efficient or not. Um, the, the, the bold uh, terms are actually also... Uh, manageable in a, in case of a renovation. Uh, so when you're not building a new building, but uh, adapting another one. Uh, step two is reduce, um, and that relates to waste heat. And um, it's good to understand that exhaust air coming from buildings always is a source of waste heat because we humans are equipment, they produce waste heat that is being ventilated out of the building. And uh, if you recover it, you could use it for preheating uh, again, um, which in, in colder climates, of course, is a thing. Um, you have heat recovery systems, therefore, um, related to exhaust air, but also wastewater is an increasingly a source of waste heat, uh, especially when you look at showers, but also the sewage system and kitchen sinks, uh, where people bas basically discharge of their boiling water for their pasta or potatoes. Um, 
More interestingly, in, on the urban level, you can look at uh, the different uh, functions that you find in a city, uh, which all have a different energy pattern, uh, a different demand for heat, cold, and electricity. Um, it's much smarter to think about how you could exchange uh, the surpluses and shortages in energy, and especially in heat and cold that, that is extra or redundant. Um, uh, one example is a study that one of my graduate students did uh, looking at a supermarket. Um, a supermarket basically uh, all year round produces waste heat because it's all, it's cooling the building and, and, and of course the fridges and freezers all year round. Um, and supermarkets need to be close to, uh, to their clients, which is normal people living there. Um, so, and these houses need heating. So um, what he did is basically looking at the possibility of the supermarket becoming the energy supplier or the heat supplier of the dwellings by combining the energy system of both and then having a interseasonal storage to cover, uh, yeah, um, to, to make it possible for summer heat to be uh, stored until winter time. Um, by doing that, he could save 60% of the carbon emissions without even looking at renovation options. So uh, in many cities, it's smarter to look at uh, smart com combinations of buildings than to, to tackle each building separately. Um, but of course, in the course that we are delivering, we're mostly looking at separate buildings. Um, and looking at the production of renewable energy, um, of course, we know that putting PV panels on the roof can yield quite some electricity. Maybe this is also a maximum way of doing that, um, but it's not necessarily optimal. And, and that has to do with the orientation of the panels. If you look well, you see that they are mainly horizontal, which means that they are mostly producing in the middle of summer or in the middle of the day when the sun is at its highest point. Um, well, in this case, of, for a supermarket, uh, that seems all right because in the middle of the day, there's still a lot of clients using it. But with a house where people are living, in the middle of the day, there people are usually out for work or for school. Um, and in summer, they are usually on a holiday. So um, in that case, it's smarter to think about other things. And you can either think of storage possibilities of electricity and batteries, which is only possible for a couple of days, or converting it to hydrogen through electrolysis. And then maybe in wintertime, uh, bringing it back again uh, uh, but then you lose more than 50% of the original quantity of energy. Um, there's also possibility to create e-fuels. There's um, yeah, explorative research now being done there. So you can basically make um, uh, carbon hydrates uh, or fuels, petrol, diesel, kerosene, uh, again, from carbon dioxide and water. Um, but you need a lot of electricity for that and green electricity, preferably. Uh, it's very expensive still, but it might be an interesting solution for the future. Um, in this course, we're not looking at these solutions, but uh, we are thinking about designing differently. And uh, by that, I mean that we could also try to uh, combine supply and demand better by, for instance, using vertical solar panels in many regions that are not very close to the equator, that this might be a good solution because they produce better in the morning uh, at east elevations, uh, in the evening at west elevations. And um, in wintertime, um, if you're in the northern hemisphere, south panels will produce more than, for instance, roof panels. And in the southern hemisphere, it will be the other way around. The north uh, elevation will do that. So uh, it might be smarter to think of this solution. Um, and PV panels have become more, uh, more affordable uh, to not necessarily go for the 100% yield uh, every time. Uh, that's more efficient, but it's not effective as I showed you. Um, and to give an example of my own students who participated in the solar decathlon, this is uh, a, a part of, a, of an office tower that was converted to uh, apartments and it uses vertical PV panels on the side, which could have had any color. Um, I choose a students chose to go for a more moderate color uh, in line with what it used to be. Uh, but it could have been red and purple as well. So that makes it also more interesting to design with. But it's not more than just solar energy. It's also about um, yeah, making an analysis of everything that's available in the surrounding. Um, and this is for Amsterdam, the inner city of Amsterdam, which has quite some canals. And it turned out that actually the potential of energy from the water is the highest uh, when compared to solar, wind, and biomass, for instance. Um, now, 
I think that's really interesting because many countries that have water, um, if you extract energy from the water, then you cool the water again, which makes the water quality better usually because uh, our water is um, has heated up already more than just, um, uh, just the air. Um, it can provide cooling in summer if you do that uh, and if you store that heat for winter time. And in our country, uh, it's, it's a cultural thing. Um, it would be really important to to make ice skating possible again, which uh, now becomes ever more rare uh, because of uh, climate change. So if we could actually use the canals as a heating source, we cool it again and we uh, might uh, get this back. Um, that's why, of course, I advocate this for the Netherlands. Um, so all in all, I, I, I mean to say that energy transition, uh, looking at trying to establish zero energy buildings can also help to make the city a better place to live. And th this is, one, another example of my solar decathlon students that looked at the renovation of a, of a tenement flat uh, with top-up apartments that have the newest PV panels that are available. So uh, the blue printed ones that you see are actually solar panels that uh, produce electricity. Um, well, that brings me back to our online courses, Sierra Energy Design. We have two, we have a MOOC, Massive Open Online Course, which is uh, still open until December now. And we have a profit, which starts uh, 3rd of October. Um, I will explain a little bit what is the difference. So the MOOC is free. Um, uh, you can do it uh, by yourself, so self-paced, uh, and it's unguided, not guided by us as experts. Um, it is open, as I said, but it will open again after winter when we've made some adjustments. Um, and if you want to, you can get a certificate at the end, which maybe helps to get a job somewhere uh, where people find it uh, important that you understand energy design. Uh, the profit is paid, so it's for professionals. It is eight consecutive weeks and it's guided. So every week you get guidance from our experts. Um, you get free access to the design builder tool and the registration is now open. Um, the course starts th 3rd of October and it's fin it finishes at the 28th of November. Um, the time needed for that is a couple of hours per week. It's not that you have to uh, be working all days during that week. Um, and in the end, a certificate will also be given if you have uh, positively finished it. What will you learn in the book? First, how to analyze the local climate and to select solutions, how to use this stepped approach that I presented, um, and how to develop a net zero energy concept for a building. Um, so I think it's very useful for many people in the world. Um, in the profit, you will learn a little bit more. So how to analyze the energy use of the building by using the tool and how to calculate your design's energy performance in the end. So um, while you're doing the assignments, you gradually get to zero energy is the idea. And therefore you get free access to a design builder tool until mid-June, and Willem van der Spoel, who is present here, will uh, guide you to learn how to work uh, with that tool. Uh, so that's quite uh, useful for professionals that uh, need to do more with that. Looking at the advanced zero energy design schedule, uh, so that's the, the profit that's being paid for, then you have uh, you have these seven weeks plus a, a eight week to finish everything. And if you look well, you see there's a different step of the approach every week. Um, there's lectures and mini films every week. Um, you get assignments in from week one to five. Um, in the end, you will have a net zero energy plan um, and there will be information online um, and online feedback. So there will be peer to peer possibilities. So with, you can have discussions with your students. Uh, there is a weekly live studio session and uh, you will get personal guidance uh, while you are doing this. Um, if you look at the Z, so zero energy design, the MOOC, then the red ones are out. So uh, um, it's slightly different. You have two films less and uh, there won't be personal guidance or live studio sessions. Um, um, but nonetheless, you, you get all the same weeks uh, with most of the lectures that are similar. Now, example of one such a week is, uh, for instance, this is week three, which is the step of reduce. Uh, you get lectures by different uh, teachers, not just the ones that I mentioned, but also others here at TU Delft uh, that uh, will give you sufficient technical information about uh, the basis that you require. Um, 
The extras are the mini documentaries of net zero energy buildings that are already there. This is only three. Uh, in total, we have five films. And there's uh, the mini film that I already introduced, Energy Slaves. Now, these are the course leaders. Um, you're watching me now. Uh, we have Sibileo and Willem also uh, on the background uh, who are doing also these uh, uh, webinars uh, during the course. And Arian is our teaching assistant who will always be there on the background to support and who will pass on questions if, uh, if there are any. Quickly going through the weeks, um, introducing you will learn about energy and power, what are the most common quantities thereof, and also how to convert kilowatt hours to megajoules and, and backwards. Um, you will also learn examples of daily uh, uh, yeah, power uh, quantities. Uh, for instance, we are now sitting, move, I'm moving a little bit, so I'm producing uh, a little over 100 watts. Uh, if I would be judoing here while presenting, then it would be much more, 10 times more. Um, and there's equipment, of course, that uh, also uh, uses energy and therefore produces waste heat. Um, and it's nice to see that a small car already is equal to uh, 100 horsepower. Um, so 100 horses carrying a car, basically. Um, also good to understand is the energetic value of fossil fuels that we are using nowadays, which is all around uh, 36 megajoules or 10 kilowatt hours per liter or per, per cubic meter. Um, and then there's other forms of energy that are a little bit lower rated. Um, in week two, you will learn to, to uh, do research on uh, things. One of the interesting things is that if you look at cities across the world, and buildings usually look as if they could be anywhere, and uh, they're not specifically designed for the local climate. So these are all different places, but you wouldn't be able to tell where they are if, if you weren't an architect. Um, so we're trying to teach you to first understand the sun. Um, and to give an example here, this is for my own town here in Delft, um, always looking at the course of the sun in say the 21st of March and 21st of uh, September and uh, the solar incident mm, uh, also looking at a uh, summer sun course um, with the orientations and the height that you establish this of course is different for every geographical location and then in winter time so this is just an example for uh, the Netherlands but um, every student will look at their own solar charts and then use that to the benefit huh? we we sometimes act as if the sun is always to the south which is uh, not true of course um so what you also learn is uh, why for instance the first habitation in europe was in caves in southern uh, france and northern spain um, and how the romans managed to already quite advanced heat their houses uh, in 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 a way that uh, was only reinvented again uh, uh, almost 2000 years later. Um, and that nowadays we are actually using mechanical ventilation, air conditioning to such an extent that we're sort of getting out of control um, as can be seen on the building on the left-hand side. Um, but of course we are mostly teaching um, how to get to positive examples. And this is the first solar decathlon example that we will be showing. Uh, that demonstrate basically how a terraced house, a row house in the Netherlands, could be retrofitted to completely sustainable. Um, looking at week three, reduce them. It's good to understand smart bioclimatic design, where we uh, learn how to use local characteristics in the sustainable design of buildings. Um, by, for instance, looking at daylight and, and sun angles and how to design with it showing, for instance, this smart example in Singapore, uh, where the sun doesn't get access to the building, but you do have daylight access, um, which saves a lot of lighting energy. Um, but we also have an example in the Netherlands of a building that is uh, um, super sustainable, that also uses light air, light heat and air in a, in a smart way, but in a more passive way. Um, and that's one of the films that we show then. Um, Week four is about reusing, and I showed a few examples already, but this is another example of cascading heat, for instance. If you have high temperature heat and you use it in a certain function, then it gets back in a lower temperature, 
which could be useful still for another function. And uh, that way we can actually use heat several times before it goes to the lowest level where we uh, need to uh, recharge it again. But that saves a lot of energy um, in, in the meantime. Last week is about producing, and there I want to show a little film, a part of the film, one of the mini documentaries of Pulse, which is a building at TU Delft. And therefore, I will stop sharing just a moment so I can switch to my browser, and then I'll get back to sharing that. Um, uh, um, um, yes. So I'm back sharing again. Um, there we go. Welcome to Pulse. Now this is probably not what you expect from an educational building, a fast food court with healthy food, but this is part of the TU Delft campus strategy to provide good food and good coffee for students and staff. But of course, it's not all about food and beverage. This is an educational building. So please follow me upstairs where we will meet the project leader. Hi, Lucy. Hi, Andy. Nice to see you. Thanks for receiving me. Yeah. What a wonderful building. Thank you. So tell me, what was the idea behind the building? So Pulse is a new education building of the university. And in this building, we emphasize on active learning. So there's not long lectures in where people are sitting and listening to one person for a long time, but it's actually very active, working in groups together. And it had to be energy neutral. Of course. Of course. As it's not natural. As a University of Delft, you can not have an energy neutral building. So this is the first energy, energy neutral building. Okay. And did you succeed to establish that? Yes, according to the design, this is energy neutral. Of course, we will have to see how the building is going to work and mm -hmm. how the use is going to be. But if it all works out as the design, then it's going to be energy neutral. Okay. But to get there, you had a different process than normal, right? Yes, we did have a slightly different process. Um, we had all the parties in the beginning of the design. We had them all together to discuss uh, how we could accomplish a energy neutral without having one voice louder than the other. In a normal process, uh, an architect makes this design, and then after some while, consultants, engineers are being asked to elaborate the design, right? So this was different here. Yes, we really had to had to have them all together from the start. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and it was a tough uh, process, but I think uh, it worked out well. Yeah, so um, have you accomplished everything or are you satisfied? No, we didn't accomplish everything. We had some nice to haves, which had because of costs we couldn't uh, we couldn't go through with them. Okay. Uh, but overall, we're very proud and happy with the result. Yeah, I cannot fully understand. Now you have to go to a meeting. Um, I'm going to have a look in the building and see some more technical features. Good. So thank you very much, Lucy. Enjoy. For okay. Thanks. <laughs> Bye. Bye. This is a space where we can see one of the most important energy measures, the building layout. In the beginning, the architect wanted to put the classroom on this side. This is a southwest elevation, receiving sun from 11 o'clock in the morning until sunset, very warm. We decided to swap the whole concept and put open work spots here and traffic whilst organizing educational rooms on the northeast side. So this is an example of uh, one of the videos that we made uh, for uh, the course. Um, I'm getting back to my presentation now. And as you can see, so we have mini documentaries which last five to eight minutes um, showing uh, how the zero energy design of that building had been established, talking also with people who were involved, like in this case, the project manager. Um, in lectures, uh, after that, such a film, we uh, explain a little bit better how it works. So this is, for instance, about that zoning that I was talking about in the film um, and um, also about uh, the technical features, uh, such as it, uh, the, the installations that were uh, being used. The final week is where you actually integrate all the things together uh, and, and to get to a nice design. So how do you combine it in, um, for instance, in a schedule? where you demonstrate what you propose and then make a calculation of your energy consumption uh, to see um, if you manage to get to zero energy. 
And this is an example of such a energy and climate scheme where you see a few features that this student used to get to a zero energy design of its, his original building. And uh, um, it's everywhere, of course, it's a different uh, solution. And um, it's always nice to see also people from the tropics coming up, of course, with totally different uh, solutions, which is uh, absolutely fine because you can't come up with the same uh, uh, everywhere. So if you are interested to learn more, um, uh, we have the Z MOOC um, again, as I mentioned, and we have the AZ, so Advanced Zero Energy Design, uh, the Prof. Ed. Um, uh, you following this at the moment could uh, uh, get a 10% discount if you join that la la later one. Um, and to register, um, you can go to online learning at tdl.nl or just scan the QR code. Um, um, and I hope to find you there. Um, I will now finish my presentation and uh, see if there's some questions left over from the Q&A. But th thanks for your attention so far. Yeah, thank you, uh, Andy, for your insightful uh, presentation. Uh, we have seen some questions uh, which are all answered uh, already uh, by uh, by the team. So, um, okay. if there are more uh, questions, uh, please. This is uh, your um, uh, your opportunity to uh, to ask Andy more about uh, the course or about um, uh, uh, energy uh, building design. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, well, see what we. Uh, Angelica, uh, what we I see get one in. question that uh, is still open in the Q and A, and I think Siba is already typing an answer, which is really good, because that's indeed yeah. the thing that Siba is teaching also in his class. Uh, but it, um, for this course, uh, we actually do not uh, include the energy use for the materials uh, when we look at zero, net zero energy buildings. But of course, it's very important to take that into account when you choose the materials that you want to include. Um, it's our plan to actually to uh, extend the course later in the new version where we uh, also look at energy and carbon that is embedded and embodied in uh, materials that we use for buildings. Um, but for now, uh, yeah, we already have a, quite a full course just looking at the energy consumption during operation of the building. But I see a few questions again in the Q&A. Uh, the TRL of H2 or of hydrogen and e-fuel systems. Um, well, hydrogen is becoming a little bit more uh, normal nowadays, especially in industrial uh, applications for buildings it's still experimental let's say trl five or six um e-fuel systems are uh, beyond uh, are uh, still earlier in the in their stage so i think that's also wise to not include it in in present day designs yet um but it's a uh, research that's ongoing and maybe in in 15 years time uh they, there will be applications for buildings um not at the moment Another question I can read is, have you tried to use CHP systems within the building? So combined heat and power systems. Um, I know that um, these have been applied, but mostly in utilitarian buildings like offices or larger uh, industrial buildings, but not really in, in homes for people. Uh, but of course it's, it's possible. And, and combined heat and power is not much different from a car engine that produces electricity and also heat in the same time. Uh, which you can use both. Um, you have them in a larger scale, but not um, you see don't see them so often in small buildings. Here on the campus at TU Delft, we have a CHP system uh, that produces uh, hot water for uh, our heating system and also electricity. But that's going to be replaced now with geothermal heat. Um, so um, CHP is run by natural gas normally, and and we're trying to get rid of that, of course, because of fossil fuel content. Then there's a question by Neg. One quick question. What would be the possibility of achieving zero energy efficiency in container buildings? Everything's possible, Neg, <laughs> uh, depending on uh, um, how you look at it and, and the steps you can take. Um, every situation is different, of course, but um, in our course, we specifically try to yeah, take into account the local circumstances of any climate, of any uh, basic building that you're looking at and then uh, try to find uh, creative solutions and technical solutions that will help. Uh, but I, I think it's possible. We also have container buildings in the Netherlands that are zero energy. 
uh, that are being sold now as, uh, uh, say, tiny houses that are super sustainable. So it's possible, yes. Bianca Nobili says, I might have missed this bit of information, but does the course also focus on zero energy systems between buildings, like the one shown in the supermarkets and private homes? Um, well, I do lecture in the course about that, um, but the assignment is mostly focused on uh, in an individual building that you can choose yourself. Uh, but it is possible to, uh, if you are in an urban situation, that you also think of possible combinations with the buildings around it. Um, uh, we've had students in the past who did that and who sort of combined the energy system to get to net zero energy. So yes, it's possible if you if you have an interesting situation uh, for the building that you are looking at. Um, Bayan says, does the course expand on the topic of energy gap between energy prediction and reality of building use? Oh, that's an interesting one. Yes, of course. Because <laughs> um, uh, there's, a, there's a difference usually between what you design and what you prepare and predict. And of course, uh, how a building is being used later. Um, we, we ask students to have a critical look about uh, at the energy use of their own building that they want to look at. So what is the actual use of energy uh, at the moment um, to understand better um, if there's a difference between what the building should use if you look at technical features and how yeah personal behavior can also influence that. Um, and that's also something to be taken into account indeed. How do people use, people use their building? Um, that's why, for instance, um, in Europe, we have the energy label that says something about the technical quality of a building and the energy performance of a building with a with an average use. But of course, then if you put in people, they can either be very energy saving or they can be squandering energy. And that makes a big difference. And um, you always have that difference. Ayet Ashnine, if I pronounce it well. Thanks for the interesting webinar. <laughs> Thank you for that comment. Uh, my question regarding existing buildings, how to deal with it? There are a lot of restrictions and regulations which make my any energetic innovations not easy. Yeah, um, that's true. Um, but it's good to know that most of the students that do our course are actually looking at an existing building. And, and sometimes it's, it's, it's um, not a, a special building in terms of being listed as a monument. But sometimes people are looking at monuments also, and and uh, they all have the restrictions that are, yeah, local locally defined. Um, so we have to work within the possibilities. Um, but sometimes it's also, yeah, our course is also about how to see what is needed, uh, regardless of the of the possibilities in 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 law, um, because sometimes law can change. Huh? In Amsterdam, um, the rules for monuments are being changed at the moment just to enable uh, buildings to become more energy efficient. And in the past, it was more strict. So in that sense, um, yes, we take into account local circumstances and, and restrictions um, and try to work around it um, and stay, yeah, try to stay within it. And if it's not possible, then yeah, to, to clarify what would be needed to change. Um, Svetoza Rodic. I've seen quite a few examples of adding a lot of plants to buildings, either on the roof or on the balconies. What do you think about that? I'm very much in favor of green, uh, adding green to the city. I, I left out a slide I normally showed, which is that uh, the simplest solution of climate adaptation in cities is uh, bringing back nature into the city and, and using a lot of plants. Um, what they do basically is 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 uh, is. Uh, Versatile. It, it, they, they shade, they uh, um, evapotranspirate and therefore cool the air around them. They, um, in, in their substrate layer, they, they um, uh, retain rainwater, uh, helping periods of drought. Um, they filter air, they uh, absorb CO2, they absorb nitrogen, etc., etc. So I think it's very important to bring plants into cities. Um, and on the roof, they can also help to actually passively cool the building in summertime, especially when they uh, stay uh, remain wet uh, during summer. Uh, so that also helps. In wintertime, it's a little bit less. Unless it's really dry, then it can help to insulate a little bit. But usually that's not the case in wintertime. So 
uh, yes, uh, please uh, think of green as one of the solutions. Patrick, and yeah, and Willem, Leo, and Siebe, if you see <laughs> questions that you want to answer, please interfere, because uh, I'm reading out now myself, but um, I can imagine that you sometimes can also say something. Can these studies form a basing for entering into university of your, for your course? Oh, yes, absolutely. The, the, there have been students that did our uh, online course and then later came to our university to do um, the on-campus courses, uh, including perhaps even the zero energy design course that uh, Leo and Siebert teach. Um, it helps, I think, um, gives you a good basis to to design in an in a energy efficient way, which um, in many cases is useful when you go to uh, our university or other universities. Um, which energy option is the best one? Zero energy building or net zero energy building? <laughs> Yeah, when I say zero energy building, uh, I actually mean net zero energy, uh, um, which means that you produce um, the amount of energy that your building uses over a year's time. But it also sometimes means that you overproduce electricity, for instance, in summertime and you have a shortage in wintertime. But over a year's time, it should be balanced. Of course, a, a totally zero energy building uh, would be really the best solution. And therefore, yeah, you need to design in such a way that you have less overproduction in summer of PV, for instance, and that you um, have more production in winter time. Um, maybe see, but that's a question for you, right? So you've been focusing on that as well, on, uh, on energy flat buildings. So buildings that actually hardly have an overproduction in summer and, and uh, underproduction in winter time. I thought I couldn't unmute. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. In the Netherlands, there, there's always uh, stays very difficult to to get uh, towards the same amount of energy production more towards the winter compared to the summer. Of course, because so much more sun energy is available. Um, but this is, of course, very interesting to to get very uh, as far as possible to this point and to reduce the. Um, yeah, the demand for storage of mainly electricity because that's uh, difficult and only yeah at the moment possible for uh, yeah for daily storage. Thanks, Siba. Um, Antonio asks, considering retrofitting, which orientation is typically out of the equation, and what areas should you prioritize or even intensify? I don't really understand that question, to be honest. Um, which orientation typically out of the equation? I think it, it doesn't say which orientation, but where orientation is typically out of the equation. Ah, OK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I, I read it in the wrong way. Thanks, Siba. <laughs> yeah. So, of course, we we look uh, we look at yeah a lot of energy reduction uh, measures, insulating, of course. And uh, yeah, producing is most often possible, and uh, doing yeah, doing smart things with uh, heat pump yeah. heat pump systems and uh, uh, reusing waste, heat, or exchanging, storing these kind of measures. Yeah, and sometimes also the climate system of these existing buildings could be changed uh, from say uh, a more air based system with radiators to uh, radiant uh, heating systems uh, that require less energy and that can bring comfort in the places where you need them. Um, so then it's a matter of um, if, if, for instance, post in insulation of the facade or roof is not possible for whatever reason, then you might think of changing the climate system internally so that uh, you don't have to do the other part, uh, but still can save a lot of energy. So as I said earlier, uh, retrofitting is, is for most students following the course, is, is the prime focus. It's not really about new construction, new building. And then indeed you are bound by, uh, to, by the orientation that's already there. That's true. Yeah. Um, um, Bradford Black. 
uh, say net present value rate of return annual. I think you, that was a question to Willem. Um, if uh, economic factors were included in the software uh, of design build, but I don't think so, Willem. Can you answer that question? No, we don't uh, do that within the course, but the software has some features, uh, possibilities to do so. So I will give. Uh... Okay, great. Thanks. Clea Bikiku says, it's not a question, in fact, but I want to share my experience. I'm attending a certification process for a tower in my country, BM certification, but it's really hard to fulfill all the standards in order to create a zero energy building. Um, yeah, I, I, I understand that. Uh, also in our own country here, um, our building legislation is actually not stringent enough to get to fully zero energy buildings. Uh, um, we, we even have the building code that says nearly zero energy. Um, so um, it's also a matter of finding the parties in the field that can, that are actually willing to go beyond what is demanded as a minimum level. And, um, um, and oftentimes that's possible uh, if you, if you um, if you have the right focus from the beginning onwards. I don't, yeah, I don't know. It's, sometimes it's something different from BREEAM certification. I, I know BREEAM. Um, if you just tick those boxes, that doesn't mean indeed that you will get to a zero energy building. That's a different type of exercise, in fact, uh, which is also why we offer this course, which is um, not just looking at a, a checklist, but really trying to get into the energy uh, design and technology. Sabine Surkan says, if so much energy is used during construction, where is the balance to be struck between building durable buildings versus building less durable buildings, but with sustainable materials? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, um, maybe this relates to if you make a zero energy building or a, a nearly zero energy building, then the energy used for operation of the building sometimes is less during a lifespan than the energy used for the materials used in the building. So um, the, the further we get with energy savings in the building, um, the more building materials become important as a factor of energy and, and carbon emissions. And that's why indeed uh, the course that Siba and Leo offer here on the campus is uh, uh, specifically also looking at the carbon that is embodied in materials so that you, yeah, you don't swap your energy saving with um, um, energy intensive materials that have a lot of carbon emissions. Uh, so I think that's the next big, next big step uh, in our uh, climate action in the built environment indeed. Ali says, since innovations in the buildings to become more sustainable need to be feasible as well, what can be the alternative way in countries with low fossil fuel energy costs in which retrofitting is not feasible? Yeah, low fossil fuel energy costs. That makes it um, that makes the argument to uh, to renovate to zero energy buildings a little bit more difficult uh, if you look, just look at money. But of course, if you would include carbon costs, um, that's a different story. Um, and it's yeah, it's about creating a sustainable future, uh, and um, um, it helps then if fuels are more expensive indeed. <laughs> so. Um, it, it's it's about looking at the feasible solutions that um, um, that are not too expensive that but that can make a big difference. So um, effectiveness then is really important, and it depends really on your location what can be effective with say passive measures. And that's why we also look at uh, bioclimatic design because that usually means that you don't have to invest a lot in the building services. Um, everything you can do without technology is already. Um, let's say it's beneficial to the final uh, performance. Um, Ayet says, I agree with you, Mr. Doublestein, thank you, regarding the renovation of existing buildings. Uh, but for example, in case of the district heat, and at the same time, the heat comes from coal power plant. Yeah, uh, like in my city in, in Germany. It is not possible to disconnect from district heating and replace it with any other clean energy source. Yeah, that, that's a transition that is usually done at a, say, at a, at a higher level of policy and politics. Um, um, in our country, it's mostly gas that we use for heat uh, district heating systems. 
it's already a bit better than coal. Um, but also we are trying to get rid of that. And that's why we're starting to use geothermal heat more or waste heat coming from waste incineration plants or, or those things. Um, but I, I can imagine indeed that uh, this is something you cannot control. Um, and the best thing you can do then is just to um, make your demand as small as possible for uh, that type of heat. Um, and force your politicians to change that, of course. Yeah. Did I forget anything, Leo or Sieber or Willem? Okay, I don't see any new questions coming in. Uh, I hope um, this was interesting to you and that um, that it's perhaps inspired you to to um, take this challenge up yourself in in whatever capacity that you are. Um, and yeah, maybe I might see some of you in the course. I see a few more questions coming in. I'll quickly <laughs> do that. Uh, the goal is to reduce the demand and storing the overgenerated heat is expensive. Is that right? Well, you know, everything that you have to store is basically uh, a sort of patchwork solution in the end. So everything that you can save in the beginning, so reducing the demand, will always help to uh, avoid problems later on with the production or storage. Um, but of course, there will always be some sort of... Um, difference between day and night between summer and winter uh, uh, so there needs to be some sort of capacity of storing uh, and that can be done in different ways uh, and um, and of course the trick is to try to get the amount of energy that you have to store and over seasonally is uh, is as small as possible um, and that can be done with the design um, i think storage is the uh, most important thing for the future uh, especially seasonal storage, yeah, so yeah. as well as heat, as as well as uh, electricity, it's yeah. a challenge for the future. True. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Leo. Uh, thank you, Anush, for your comments. And uh, will you be sharing today's recording? Yes, we will. Uh, Angelique, you will share that. Uh, with yes, all the we will indeed share the recording. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we might even share it also on LinkedIn or whatever, so that also people that could not attend can still watch it. Okay. Um, well, nice to see you in a month's time, Cindy and Metin. Thank you also. And thanks all of you for uh, being uh, here and uh, providing good questions. And um, we we'll hope to see you around and um, soon again. Thanks yes. for hosting it, and uh, we will be in touch anyway for the coming weeks. Yes, thank you also, uh, Andy, for being with us and all the others uh, being here uh, this afternoon uh, to uh, or morning. Uh, depends where you are. Um, so, yeah, we hope to see you um, in one of our courses. Um, and uh, for now, I will uh, end this, uh, this session. Okay. Thank bye -bye, you. Bye-bye.